Hi, I'm Graham Marsden. I'm on Britain's longest river, a wild and windy River Severn, the gale force winds rushing through the trees, and I'm here to fish for chub, one of Britain's most popular species, found in probably every river in Britain, even up Scotland on the River Annan, although they're not looked on too kindly up there because of the salmon. Here we love them. All you've got to do is look for swims with character, because they're very obliging fish. Typical swims are rubbish rafts, overhanging trees, undercut banks, roots of trees reaching into the water like a negro's fingers stretching out. Look for all these fishes and you're laughing. You can't go wrong. Look at this swim here. We've got thick roots going into the water, reaching out. A bit further down, there's a stump sticking out and some smaller branches coming out from that. That'll be like a canopy, which will be shaded and dark. They love things like that, chub do. I can almost guarantee there'll be one or two chub under there. Over the other side of the river, there's willow trees. There's a, quite a large willow there. The wind's blowing the leaves up and you can see the bright silver underside of the leaves. Underneath, again, we've got a lovely shaded area. If we were fishing that bank, we could drop a stick float down there, underneath that gap under the willow, really... Oh, it'd be superb, that would. It'd be really good. We could flirt a few casters in or maggots, or later on when it starts going dust, we could drop some bread in. A bit farther along, we've got another willow, which is actually, the branches are actually touching the water, reaching out into the water. That would be a really dark hole, and you could run a, a, a crust, a piece of cheese under that. They'd love that. A bit further up, we've got some slack water, really nice and slack. Another feature I should mention here, really, just mentioning slack water like that. When you've got a current going down the middle, slack water on each bank, like we have over on that far bank there, a nice slack piece, look for the crease. It's like a dividing line between the current and the slack. And that dividing line, that crease as we refer to it, put a float down there, a stick float, nice and steady down that crease. Or cast out a feeder, Get the maggots of the casters going down that crease. Again, you could almost guarantee chubs. They're really obliging fish. OK, let's talk about one or two baits. <laughs> That's a joke to start with. It's more like 200. We've got bread in all its forms. Flake, paste, crust. And then we've got cheese. Cheese paste, blue stilton, brie. Anything. They love it. Worms, Peter Stone once caught one on a chip. Then we got the usual baits, maggots, casties, pal of mine, Eric Barnes, he once had one on a bait and rind. But I've not got anything like that today, I've, I've no chips, I've got no baiting. I'm hoping for one or two fish. I've got the usuals, casties, maggots, hemp, bread, bit of cheese, should catch. I'm going to use the feeder first, get some bait in the swim. Before I do though, let's have a look at this rig I'm using. The rod, lovely flexible rod. It's what you want really, it's not, it's not a quiver tip rod. But uh, there's enough action there that you can use lines down to a couple of pound anywhere, no problem. It's a Shakespeare International Carbon Feeder. It suits me for all sorts of chub fishing, not just for feeder fishing. The real Sigma Graphite, again by Shakespeare. Skirted spool, not so many years ago we weren't using this type of reel. But uh, there's not very many of the other sort made now, they're nearly all skirted spool. The line I'm using, it's a three pound main line. And I'm on 2.6 bottom. Very simple rig, I'll just put the rod down. Drennan feeder. A small running bead and a link swivel so that I can simply take the feeder off and swap that for a bomb. No problem at all if I want to swap over. Plastic ledger stop. Again, you can soon loosen it off. Change the position if you want to use a, a longer hook length or a shorter hook length. No problem at all. 
And if the thing I don't like about ledges, these plastic ledges stops, is even fishing very heavy, they've got a tendency to slip. The force of the weight on there makes it slide down, and that doesn't do your line very good at all. It's no good for it. So in a case like that, I would tie a little swivel in. The main line to one eye of the swivel, and the hook length to the other eye of the swivel. Again, there's no problem, because your ledge, the, the swivel then becomes your, your ledger stop. Hook, today, or to begin with anyway, let's put it like that. I, I may change later on, but to begin with, I'm using an 18s, and I'm going to probably use a couple of casters on that. I'm going feed maggot and caster, caster on the hook, keep the feed going down. One problem on this river, this particular stretch of river, is that you get quite heavy boat traffic. There's pleasure boats, cruise, cruiser types, all kinds, as well as commercial boats, and they're up and down quite regularly. And they're causing a lot of disturbance on the bottom. There's like a wash. And no matter how careful you are and how accurate you are with your feed, it's spreading that feed around, so you've got to have constant feed, if only for that reason alone. Anyway, let me get some bait in. Let's see. Uh, we never going to get any fish. I'll try white maggots first. I've got yellow maggots, but uh, I don't know what they want, but you've got to start somewhere, and white's as good as any. Now we get some feeding. This type of chub fishing is what I call pleasure chub fishing, where you come along with your maggots and casters, fish as small as you can. You can catch anything. Gudging. In this stretch, you've got bleak, where I normally fish down the Atchim area. You don't get them down there, there's loads of them here. It's perch, roach, could catch anything. I'm hoping for chub, obviously, but you just never know, and you've got to take things as they come. I may catch, oh, half an hour or more pulling gudgeon in, bleak. If I'm really unlucky, I won't get anything. But uh, the thing is, you've got to keep this feed going in. I'm not really bothered if I catch anything or not. As long as I keep the feed going in, for a, uh, within reason. I mean, when I say I'd not bother if I don't catch anything, I mean I'm not bothered if I don't catch anything for a, a while while the feed's going in. I'm interested in chub, not the, the gudding and the bleak. If they come along, I'll have to suffer them. And I mean that kindly, suffer them, because I like to catch what I've set out to catch. Even if I am, uh, pleasure fishing where you're liable to catch anything. My favourite way of chub fishing is to go for a couple of hours in the evening with like a stalking set up. You can do this on the on the upland rivers. This river, the River Seven up at the, in the Verney area and round there, Welsh Pool, Newtown. My own local little river, the Dane. It's a great river for stalking. All you need is your rod, your reel, landing net, a loaf, say, or a little tin with some cheese in, anything like that. And what you, oh, that was a little knock, probably a gudgeon. No. Nope. So keep this feed going in. Yeah, so minimum setup, in other words. No, the bait's not even sucked. When that happens, it's usually a small fish, and I didn't give it time to suck it enough to renew the bait. Anyhow, as I was saying, the stalking setup. Minimum requirements, because you're going roving. You're going roving along the river, looking for the different swims, the ones I was telling you about with all the character, the rafts, creases in the swim, weed beds. Look for these features. One thing you can do as well, once you've walked along a river and you've spotted a few swims, you can mix a bit of mashed bread up and you can drop a little bit of this mashed bread and each swim as you walk along. Let's say you do half a dozen and you get to the top of the stretch. Get to the last swim and you put your mashed bread in and then walk back right to the beginning again at the first swim you baited and fish that one. It should have settled by then you see chub moving in because what you find sometimes Quite often, actually, when you're on these uh, two-hour evening sessions, 
Oh, and by the way, an hour before dark and an hour or so into dark, that's the best time of all for chub. Right, you're back to the first swim. The chub have moved in on the mass bread you've put in. You catch one. One thing about chub as well, if you don't get a bite within 10 minutes, move. I'm not talking about this kind of fishing because with feeder fishing, we try and attract fish into the swim. Not so much with that we know the fish are already there, but we're trying to attract them into it with the feeder. Anyway, with the roving style, the chub should be already there because you picked out the good swims, you know the river. So in your first swim, give it 10 minutes. If you don't get a bite, move into your second swim. Give that 10 minutes. Because you can almost guarantee at that time of night, hot time for chub, you get one within 10 minutes if you don't move. Pack in, go somewhere else, find another swim. But on a good day, you can get a chub out of all those swims. Probably not more than one, if you... Hang on. Probably not more than one, because chub soon... Ah, that's uh, got in the net. Hang on, let's just free the... Got to be careful here. Luckily it's only small, it should come out easy enough. That's where losing my concentration. Vital with any kind of fishing. That's the thing with chub though. If Once you've taken one out of a swim, on the kind of upland river I'm talking about, you've got to be very, very lucky to take another one within a reasonably short time because don't forget you're only down there for a couple of hours in the evening two or three hours anyway so uh, really catch one fish and then move let's keep this bait going in because I'm trying to work a swim up here keep casting to the same spot this is essential with swim feeder fishing keep the feeder going into the same spot each time it's even more important really than when you're fishing on a still water because the current is picking the feed up out of the feeder and taking it down it in a, in a stream. It's in a, a steady line down the, the swim. Won't go too far on, on this particular piece because the river's not very strong. But it's even more essential not to cast at different distances because you can have more than one line of bait going down the swim then. You don't want to split any shoals up, you want to keep the shoals together. And on that one line, that's the end of the rainbow, attracting it to you, attracting it to your hook bait. You've, you've got to keep doing that, you've got to keep that feed going in on the one line, keep the shoal all together. Uh, I'm rabbiting on like this and I'm not getting me swim fed, let's get some in. Keep a good rhythm going, obviously you're going cast a lot more often at this stage of the game because you, you're feeding the swim, you slow down the the rate of feed as you start getting bites and you know how much they need. Let's see what we can do. I've had a couple of taps anyway, probably just gudging. But that last bite, just having a look at the maggots, just when I baited up again then, it wasn't sucked as much and it was a slightly harder knock than the other one. So I've got a feeling there could be one or two moving. Oh, yeah. No, it's no chub. Oh, it's not gudging either. Ah, uh, perch. Little perch, that's all. I'll to keep it going. Keep this bait going in. Here's the boats we're telling about. Here's a long boat now. And a little cruiser behind. The old sending the wash up the bank, taking the line of feed away. This is why we've got to keep things going. Keep the feed going in all the time. Get some bait back in quick. It's a nice boat. The dab chick. A little cruiser behind. The big barges they don't half make some swell come up on the bank. So I've got to be careful of these maggots here. They soon wash you over this box. And let's get this feed back in. Back to the same spot. The swell's not too bad now so if it was really bad off a, a barge or anything, uh, I wouldn't bother to cast for a while because there's that much swell. It would just wash all the feed out from the path and try and create. So, 
Right, in business again. No, it's a nice smooth water now. Here's the swell coming in now from the last barge to go through. Again, not too bad. It's worthwhile carrying on fishing. You see what I mean about the, the wash coming up on the maggots? It's a, it's a problem. And you've got to watch the keep net as well because you keep collapsing the net if you're not careful. That's why it's best have it down the slope out of the way of the swell. That's a nut. Hang on, what have we got? Anything? Another small one. Yeah, just a little gudging. Still, it just shows that feed's working. We're getting more and more of these, so we, we're collecting fish in the swim. The wrong sort of fish just yet, but I'm, I've no doubt the chub will come. I've got to be a bit careful here because there's a weed bed. And uh, snags for chubs, natural haunts. They they live in snags, they love snags, like I pointed out to you earlier about the overhanging rubbish rafts, uh, overhanging willow trees, roots and branches coming into the water. Same applies out there, snags you can't see, the weed beds. They love those, they're the homes of chub. But there's no better place to fish to get chub from as long as you use the right tackle. Obviously there's no point in fishing snags with the uh, one two pound line and a, a 20 suit. You've, not for big chub anyway, if it's up to a pound you're not so bad, but if you're thinking a three, four pound fish or even bigger, you've got to use at least, what, five pound line for snags anyway, and a hook at, at least a 12s, if not a 10s or an 8, something like that. And when you get the bites with a snag, it's a case of two words, hook and hold. In other words, you get the rod, you strike, hook them and hold like that, hold hard. Don't give them an inch. Don't let them so they can go anywhere. You've got to hold them like that. And if you've done it right, you'll pop them out of the snag. It's, if you give them too much slack line, if they can get just a foot on you, they can wrap you around something. And chub are infamous for getting rid of hooks. They can, I don't, nobody knows how they do it, but they can transfer hooks from the mouths to a snag, no trouble at all. So although the, the key words, who can hold? Let's get this bait in. We've got to keep this line of bait going down all the time. No break in it at all. Little and often. Little, little and often. They're the other two key words. Fill the feed it. Back in, same line. Don't forget that same line. Important point. And we're in. Right, let's see if we can get a chub. They must be soon. They must come soon. Yes! This is no gudging. Yes, yeah, it's a chub. It's a chub, all right. Come on. Yeah, come on, baby. Oh, Gonna cross the river a bit from where... I Picked it up, away from the line, probably a snag over there it's heading for. Do you know where all the snags are? Yeah, it's going a bit now. Yeah, come on then, come on. See a lovely soft top on this rod? You can use a light line and that lovely soft top there takes all the shock absorber effect. Once you've, you've with chub there's like a, a couple of minutes of hard battle and then they seem to give up at some stage and then other chub they, they'll fight all the way to the net see there's another snag on the left it's trying to head for oh it's doing well this one is come on come on it's not very big but it's a start it just shows chub are moving in the swim they are a shoal fish so there'll be more where that came from come on then that's a good one chub Another name for chubs, Chavindy. That's an old English name, but nobody calls them that now, they're just called chub. What a beautiful fish. Here's one thing to notice. On the anal fin, 
it's concave on the anal fin of a dace it's convex and dace look very very much like chub in the smaller sizes and that's the way you can identify which species you've caught convex on the chub concave on the dace and you can't go wrong then let's have him in the net get some more feeding it's obviously doing a lot of good maggot again fill the feed it so it top it up back to the same spot remember the important thing, keep that line of feed going down. Down the rod rest, and let's see if we've got any more there. If these fish do move in, these chub, and I start getting a few bites, I think it'd be worthwhile going on the float. I'll try that next because there's plenty of feed going in on the feeder now, like I said earlier on. Keep that feed going in with a feeder. Got a nice line of feed down there now. We'll try the float. Oh, that's no chub. Oh, barbel, definitely. The chub just don't go like that. Come on. Come on, my beauty. This is a chance you take when you're fishing for chub on light lines. 2.6 line, 18 zook, you could, you could barbel any time, you just never know, especially when you're fishing with caster. Caster on maggot, luncheon meat, barbel, love all those. I've got it boring off now. Ah, got to be careful here, there's a snag around this area. Like your barbel head for snags, no problem at all. Come on then. Come on. Yep, headed for the snag. Not much you can do about it on light line. Oh, it's solid, solid. It's in the snag. It's still on, there's still some movement there. Let's just try giving it a little bit of slack, see if it'll swim out. That sometimes works. Slacken straight off, see if there's any movement. Now, there's no movement on the tip now. now. I don't give it too much slack, I don't want the hook to fall out, it being a small one. Right. No, still solid. If I could get downstream of the snag, I'd have a good chance of getting it out. But the water's too deep here, I can't wade down. No, I can't budge it. Let's go and put the rod in the rest and give it some slack and see if it'll swim out in a few minutes. Sometimes they do, it's, a, it's worth taking a chance. Open the bail arm, we'll just put the fingers on the spool and then we'll know there's, when there's any movement. We've got a completely slack line now. This is the only chance we've got. If it swims out of the snag and swims downstream, we're in business again. Keep your fingers crossed. Doesn't feel like too big a fish, but uh, all barbel are good, they're all worth catching. I know we're here for chub, but we can enjoy catching anything, can't we? A great day like today. The weather's gone a lot nicer, it's beautiful, it's turning out great. 
I hate losing fish though, especially if I leave a hook in or a piece of line. So we're going to do his best to get this one out. No movement on the tip at all yet. It's just not moving. It's just a matter of patience now. We've just got to wait. I'll give it five minutes. We'll see what happens. Now I've sat here for oh, a good two or three minutes now. There's been no movement on the tip. There's only one thing we can do and that's uh, put a bit of pressure behind the rod. Hope for the best. We may pop him out, we may not. But otherwise we've got to get the tackle back as much of it as we can. And that's it. Let's see what happens. We'll wind down to it. And we'll give it a good tug because sometimes that... No. It's just as solid as it ever was. Probably the fish is long gone. Transferred the hook to the snag just like Chubb can. So there's only one thing now, we just have to pull for a break. Unfortunate, it's one of those things. It happens in fishing more often than we'd like at times. This is the way to pull out of a snag like this. Don't put too much pressure on your rod. Put the rod down. Put your fingers over the spool like that to stop it turning and just a straight pull so all the pressure is on the line and not on the rod. Let's keep going. Keep taking all the pressure up. Walk backwards if you have to, just keep constant pressure. That's it, we're free. No fish. Still, what's the name of the game? The bad part of the game. It's a chub, but it's a, oh, it's a better one, this one. This is what we come for. This is a real chub. Come on, it's gone upstream. It's going upstream, this one is. It's always a sign of a bigger fish when they start moving upstream. Come on, then. God. Oh, it's going well, this one. Yeah. Come on. Keep the rod up. Come on, then. Come on. Go. Come on. Yeah. Oh, that feed's definitely paid off anyway. This is the a good sign there. Definitely. Come on. Come on. Yeah. Keep the rod high, you soon tire them out. Let them bounce around on that rod tip. Let the rod do its job, the shock absorber effect. Oh yeah, oh yeah, nice fish. What a beautiful chub. Oh yeah, what a cracky. What a cracky. Worth catching any day of the week. Look at that, what a belting fish. What a beautiful fish. Beautiful bit of weed around him. I think fair and square on the top lip. Oh yeah, there's no way that one was going to get off. No way. Yeah. How about that then? Hey! Brilliant! Tremendous stuff. So you can get another one like that. What a cracky. Pop him in the net. Oh yeah, great. Go on baby. Tremendous. Right, let's see what we can. Tell you what I'll do now. I'm going to go on my favourite method for river fishing. I absolutely love stick floating, trotting down. Okay, I may, I may do better on the ledger by sticking on that and the feeder. It looks like we've got a shoulder chub in and we've got that line of feed going down and they're there but so I, I love float fishing let's go for it as you can see it's starting to rain the weather's gone dull very cloudy let's talk about floats that's an original stick float devised by Benny Ashist and he, had, he used it in the first place to 
for catting roach on the Macclesfield Canal, I believe it was. It's definitely canals anyway. For casting to the rushes on the far bank using casters, which before that time were called chrysalis. It's only since that day casters have actually been called casters and not chrysalis. Balsa, which is very buoyant. Cane, which is dense and will sink. And the idea behind it was that you balanced the balsa and the cane to give you exactly what you wanted in the amount of shot you used down the line. The more balsa you used, the more buoyant the float would be and the more stable it would be. Plenty of cane down, the, down at the bottom end and the, f the fewer shot you need and the more self-cocking the float became. More boat traffic going past. Gonna have a few more waves again in a minute. Anyway, that was the idea behind the stick float, and an excellent idea it was. And it was taken up later for trotting on rivers. Not too far out because you lost control then, but caster fishing on rivers with a stick float, it became the universal method. From there, the development of the stick float, that's another one, which is called a wire stem stick. Exactly the same principle, only the wire down below give you a little bit more control when you wanted to lift the bait off the bottom, but I'll, I'll tell you about that a bit later. The latest development with stick floats is, this is a Drennan one, again balsa, but plastic. Exactly the same principle, no different at all, and you would use that in this, exactly the same situations as you'd use those two. Now then, the very latest thing, again made by Drennan and Dick Clegg. And this is called a stable stick. We've got balsa and we've got plastic. But the difference with this one is that we've got this bulge of plastic at the bottom. And that makes that float more stable. All stick floats cast accurately, but this one especially so. And it'll cast further, so you would use this in deeper water naturally in deeper water because you're casting further and that's almost certain that's where the deeper water will be in the centre channel and you've got much more control over your stick float with a stable stick than any other one in those sort of conditions right I'll show you the setup this is a Shakespeare boron 13 foot match rod very supple in the tip. You can use light lines on it down to oh, 12 ounce if you like. 22 zooks, no problem at all because that suppleness in the tip gives you that margin of safety, that shock absorber that you need for that kind of fishing. Tackling up a stick float, it's quite different than any other kind of float fishing. It's fastened with two rubbers. If you only fasten with one rubber at the bottom, it used, that used to be called peg leg. But again, that's an old fashioned term and it's now known as waggly when it's only fastened with one rubber on the bottom. The stick float is always attached to the line with two rubbers. One right near the end of the tip, the sight bob, and one right at the bottom. And then you've got the unique shotting pattern which you get with stick floats. This particular one it's always printed on them, it's a number four stable stick and it takes four BB but that doesn't mean you've got to use four BB shot you can use any combination that adds up to four BB in this case I've used all number fours and the pattern of shotting I've used is known as shirt button style and I've put one every six inches down the line until we get down here all number fours they are right to there and then I've got a a greater distance between the penultimate shot and the bottom shot which is a number six because I want that to be that little bit lighter and that smaller shot is known as a telltale shot this is set slightly deeper than the actual depth of the water because I like to drag bottom at times with a few inches of line in some cases, in some situations you could even drag with two or three foot that's an extreme but it, 
in some situations that can be the best bet. This is a 1.7 line. It's a number 20 hook and that's about right to start with. I might find I've got to go lighter. I may be able to go heavier, I don't know. We'll have to see what happens in that case. Anyway, let's, let's start fishing. Normally, when I fish with a stick float, I would sit here for up to 15, 20 minutes sometimes. Usually five or 10 minutes, here's another this is a big one coming up, a barge. Oh, it's a pleasure boat, this one. Anyway, normally when I'm stick float fishing, or even waggly, I would spend at least 10 minutes firing bait in before I even fished to establish the swim. What it does, when I, when I say establish, I mean that it's giving the fish confidence. You can fire bait in the swim, and get the fish feeding and during that period you won't be you don't want to be catching any fish you want to make the fish think that they're safe and secure nothing's happening to them there's bait going in the swim they're picking the bait up they're feeding there's no members of the shoal disappearing which will be happening we hope when we start fishing so that 5 10 15 minutes with however long you want to go is always well worth it before you actually start fishing to establish the fish's confidence make them feel safe and secure and when you do start fishing it'll make all the difference in the world because you'll be able to catch quite a few fish before they become spooked anyway let's get some bait in we'll have a few trots down we'll see what's happening I'm going to use casty I'll put a couple of good pouch fulls in Again, remember to keep the bait going down the same spot, keep the same line of feed. Let's put the bait up here on a catapult with an handy reach because we've got a good feeding rhythm going now, so we've got everything to hand nice and handy. I put one caster on, on the twenties. I'll pick a dark caster out to begin with. I mean, it might sound strange. There's dark casters, light casters. There's even white ones, which are the ones which have not turned very much yet. There's some still wriggling very slightly, but tomorrow they'll still be white, but they'll be completely lifeless. The dark ones are the ones that have turned first, and when you get them where they very very dark, they'll be floaties, but they're still good out bakes because they're semi buoyant and they'll rise off the bottom. Right. I'm just going to nick it in the end like that. We may find that I'm going to have to bury the hook at some stage if they're very, very shy, but to begin with, I'll just hook it through the end like that. All right, casting with a stick float. You're always better if you can just flick out like that. That's all you need. Stop the line on the spool there, just before it hits water, and that straightens it all out, so it all lands in a nice straight line. And then down we go. Let line out as it's required, using the tip of your finger on the spool. Nice control over there. To go down nice and steady. There's another way of fishing a stick. I'll show you that in a moment. Let's just let a, a nice steady run to begin with all the way through the swim. Again I've got to be a little bit careful here because I'm fishing very light and there's a snag just down there so I'm not going to go too far because I'm on very light tackle and I can't afford to get snagged. Let's put a, another pouch full of bait in. I've got to keep this feeding pattern going. I'm putting a, a pouch full in at this stage because I can afford to. Later on I shall slow this down to half a pouch full and then later on still perhaps only a dozen casters. Yeah, the caster's still okay. Let's have another. Yeah, a nice straight line. 
Now then, the other way of fishing a stick, which is really the correct way of fishing one, put your, drop your finger down on the spool and hold it back. That makes the line, this is the old idea of the shirt button style, that when you hold back, the line rises like that and the bait rises. Whoop, a little bite. No. A little bleak pecking or something. Back in again. Yeah, you, even though you're fishing over depth at times, that holding back, when you you know where the rises in the riverbed are, which you learn through experience as you go down, you'll you'll find out where the float gets pulled under when it's snagged, uh, where you can afford to let the float go, where it's clear and it deepens. But where it, where it does rise, that's when you can drop your finger down and let, let the bait rise up and clear it till it goes over the other side. It's a tremendous technique, it takes a lot of learning, but it's well worth it because once you've learned how to use it and you become really competent with a stick float, you can really catch a hell of a lot of fish. It's a tremendously efficient method. Let's put another pouch full of bait in. I'll reduce the amount this time. Just over half a pouch. That's it. And go down again. Again, just a, a sideways flick with the rod. Drop your finger on the spool, straighten the line out, and away we go. No problem. Yeah. A uh, little gudging. I might. Put the rod down. That's the trouble of fishing very light with single baits on 20 hooks. You, you catch these small fish, but uh, you've got to put up with it. It's as simple as that. There's nothing you can do about it. Just keep pulling them out until the bigger ones come along. Once the bigger ones do come, you'll find that these will disappear because the big ones will push them out of the swim and then you're in business. You'll pop him in the net. the bait on. That's it. Plenty of boat traffic today, there's another one coming down. That doesn't help but nothing you can do. Right, see if any chubs have come in yet. There we go. Nice and steady and nicely down the swim. Um, uh, here's a boat coming past now. I suppose these fish get used to it, but uh, I don't. <laughs> That's a fact. It doesn't help my fishing at all. Still, you pay your money and you take your choice. It's as simple as that. Whoop! No. Let's let the water settle and we'll get back in with some more bait. Reduce the amount again, down to about two dozen casters now. That's it. Now the water's settling now, let's have another run down. Let's just have a look at the bait first in case it was sucked. No, it's fine. Draw back, nicely, nice straight line. Let's go. Yes. Oh, this isn't a gudgeon, this is a chub. Yeah, it's a chub. Just got to watch that snag, and I'm only on light line. I've got to be very, very careful. Very careful. Yeah. Yeah, it's a chub. It's a chub. Come on. Oh, it's going upstream. I don't pull at it. Not with the 1.7 and a 20. It's got. But let it go. Backwind, that's the best way of playing a fish when you're on light lines. Backwind, never mind the the drag. You can tighten that right up, it doesn't make any difference. When the fish wants to go, just backwind and let it go like that. 
No, it's not particularly a big fish. It's coming in pretty easy, this one. Come on, baby. Yes, come on there, like a submarine coming up. A small sub, yeah, but still. Yeah, here we go. That big mouth come out of the water. Beautiful. Oh, great. That's it, get on there. Oh, that's not a bad fish. Oh, yeah. Well worth catching on stick float because they're all good ones on that kind of tackle. One like that. Oh, smashing. Beautiful. Very nice. Very pleased with that on stick float. 20 zoot, 1.7 line. As long as you've got a good rod, nice supple top. That makes all the difference. In you go. Let's get back in, get another one. Get some feed in first. Keep that feed going in and keep the shoal. I put a couple of pouchfuls in this time. That's it. They love casters. Love casters. Sometimes these lines are harder to catch than the bloody fish, yeah. Cast it. That's it. I haven't had to bury the caster, by the way. Started catching now, just looking through the top. So there's no need for that. Flick, and we in. Nice trot down. Yeah. Ooh. Yes. Next trot down. God, we must have a good shoal in now. Those casters are doing a lot of good. We got to watch that snag. Yeah, come on. Steady, nice and steady. Let the rod do the work. Come on, man. Come on. Boat's coming as well. I don't want to. Yeah, come on then. Come on. Oh. Steady on. Oh. Get the boil on the water then. Oh, it's going a fair bit this one. They can fight sometimes, these chub. I mean, sometimes they come in like a wet sack. But not very often. It's uh, the good scrappers, all in all. Especially when you're fishing near snags, you can't afford to take chances with them. Cut, cut. Oof. Come, on. Oof. Come on, baby. No, oh, he's trying to head out to deeper water again. No, no, turned. Come on, come on, behave yourself. No, he's trying to head for that snag. Be very, very careful. A 20s, it's very fine wired. If keep that rod straight, though, and you're okay. You don't want to wear a bigger hole in the lip by keep one side and then the other. Just keep it up like that, nice and steady. Let the rod do the work, just let it pump on the end. Come on, then. Come on, me beauty. Come on, then. never mind that boat, he won't help you. Come on, then. Come on then. Yes! Look at that mouth. You wouldn't think a big mouth like that or what a little caster that I give it. Still, I reckon they get enough on them, they're happy. Beautiful. Beautiful. What a lovely, f oh, what a spanky. What a spanky. Look at that. A cracking fish. Yeah. Oh, really nice. In, in the scissors this time. You're really going for these casters. What a cracky fish. Let's have it in the net. Beautiful. Let's have another one. Let's get some bait in. Keep that bait going in.
do one pouch full. They seem to be well on the feed now, but we don't want to overfeed them. Put a bait on. Through the end again. Get a wash off these boats. God, no wonder the banks are getting eroded. So when there's any bank left sometime, they keep this up. Technical hitch. You've noticed I've waded in the water. It's much easier than you clear the trees around you, and if, as long as you're careful, it doesn't make any difference. It's strange, really, that you can go on some rivers and you've got to creep around and you can still spook the fish. It seems like here, on most rivers where there's match fishing, you can wade in and do what you want, more or less, and they seem to be used to it. They don't bother, probably the boats get them used to disturbance as well. Let's put a bit more bait in. Fresh caster on. Sit. Well, it's must be twenty minutes now since he had those two fish on the stick float. I've had a damn good day, but it looks like I've lost the shoal. Must have been a very small shoal, or I've spooked them or something, I'm not sure which, but uh, they seem to have gone. It's raining again, it's dull. It's been great though, who cares about that as long as we've had a few... Oh! Yes! <laughs> Just when you least expect it. <laughs> I don't know, fish is full of surprises. Another good fish as well. I'll be steady with this one. I usually end a day's fishing with one last cast. But I usually have about 12 last casts. When I go, oh, my wife says to me, where have you been? You're late again. I said, well, I've had a, a last cast. How many last casts have you had? Well, I'll make this my last cast, even though I've got a fish, because you can't be ending fishing on a high note, can you? Beautiful fish like this. What a cra oh, what a crack! It's a good one as well. Oh yeah. yeah come on then. No, no, he's not ready yet. He's not ready. Oh. Yeah, look at that. What a beauty. Full of it. This one is. Really got aggravated. Come on then. You're at it now. I'm ready for home. Oh yeah. Great. What a great fish. Oh, it's a really nice chub. What a lovely sample of a chub. Look at that. What a cracker. Well, he was a lovely fit fish. What a lovely specimen, lovely deep body, beautiful head, nice fins, great fish. I've had a cracking day. <laughs>